panelists and uh, the participants who of course we cannot see to this uh, webinar or given the constraints i think under which it's held covinar might be a better word for it <laughs> otherwise you'd be actually face to face for a discussion on this wonderful brilliant and uh, eminently readable book by uh, tamal bandopadhyay pandemonium and uh, it's an unusual book i must say it written reads at places like a thriller and it's easy for you know the lay person to follow it does not go into heavy theory on financial markets on uh, bank and you know financial crises and monetary theory and uh, so and we look forward to his own uh, summary of its uh, salient points uh, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the banking crisis you know has been with us for some time and it is and if you are to single out three or four major problems in the you know economic universe today this would be among the the top uh, the book does a forensic analysis of what's gone wrong there are some forward looking issues and uh, i thought Uh, the best part of the book was the discussion with four uh, former governors of the reserve bank which offer great uh, insight dr rangarajan dr reddy dr subbarao and uh, dr raghuram rajan and uh, so for the last uh, two decades as we know that the indian banking system has been plagued by non performing assets and uh, uh, banks have uh, either failed or in a failing position uh, and uh, the book traces the journey of the banking sector and the book is divided into five parts the first discusses the genesis of npas then the second discusses the problems of the public sector banks and what could be done to correct the situation and uh, part 3 discusses some of the high profile cases uh and part part 4 is the views of the four governors on uh you know what went wrong and what can be done to remedy the situation and the final part exam has some forward looking issues on uh, what can be done and i thought it has a very useful statistical appendix which puts gives you know a timeline of various useful data uh and it's something which you know i will treasure going forward um uh, um uh, and uh, so without much ado uh i will request uh, mr bandobadhyay to introduce his uh, book this will be followed by a panel discussion to be chaired by sound and which covers a number of issues in addition to npas like corporate debt restructuring the ibc corporate bond markets nbfcs project financing dfis digital transformation blockchain and financial technology and yes i forgot to introduce the others who are there on the panel mr jaspreet bindra who is an expert on digital transformation blockchain and in this very uh, mysterious area of financial technology uh, then we have uh, mr anand narayan who is an associate professor at uh, spjmir and an analyst and uh, ms soundre who is senior fellow at icrear and she specializes in industry and international trade so without much ado i will request uh, mr bandupadhyay to tell us about his book and following that sound please take over to moderate the discussion absolutely uh, thank you thank you professor shield for your very kind words Uh, and a lot of encouragement for an author <laughs> so i would not take much time i'll just very very brief outline because i think uh, there will be exciting discussion um, uh, moderated by shyam so um, uh, very briefly uh, what was the provocation of the book why i called it pandemonium and a few things i want to highlight uh, you know it was in uh, october 2019 precisely 15th october our fi- our finance minister was Uh, speaking at columbia university a law school and it was a prepared speech 
and after and in the, after her speech there was a moderated discussion the moderator was uh, dr arvin panagaria so one of the questions uh, asked um, our gentleman stood up and asked uh, our finance minister uh, mrs nirmala sitaraman uh, he referred to a speech uh, given by uh, former reserve bank of india governor dr rajan at brown university and referring to the speech he asked whether uh, too much of centralization in power in the current administration in indian government is responsible uh, for india not attaining uh, the potential growth uh, that was the question i mean the sum and substance is this of course the language probably was not exactly like this so our finance minister asked this gentleman to repeat the question again which he did and then she took her own time to answer it was a pretty long answer but the substance of it is this that yes she respects dr rajan as an economist but it is when dr rajan was uh, the governor of reserve bank of india and dr manmohan singh was the prime minister of india during that time india's public sector banks which account for a large part of banking system probably the largest among comparable economies was the indian banking system had the worst time so that that's what she said uh, i got a um, uh, call from new york real time this gentleman he is familiar with my work he is an indian but based in nri in new york in the financial space he asked me tamal you have been writing on uh, banking for quite some time your column etc etc what do you think how do you react to this of course i refrained from reacting because i was not on the spot i did not know what exactly happened but then it is a proverbial said the ball rolling i thought um, here is an um, probably we should think and we should look into this uh, who is responsible for the mess that's how the idea of a book was of this particular book was born and of course the publisher is any book is a joint venture between a publisher and an author this book is no exception uh, and then i reached out to the uh, all the past governors i wanted to get their point of view uh four of them agreed to speak to me and these are the pre covid days it is all not email interviews uh so uh, dr sangarangarajan uh, dr reddy dr subbarao and um, and rajan four of them agreed to speak to me they did speak so there are certain areas were common but certain were specific to them like for instance my question to dr rangarajan was what you responsible for this because he he you meaning dr dr rangarajan abolished the dfis and embraced universal banking but the, our bankers never understood uh, beyond working capital loans the project loans uh, so is this is this the genesis of the crisis or for instance the question very pointed question to dr reddy was there is during his time between 2006 and 8 indian indian uh, period uh, 9% plus growth 30 odd percent uh, credit growth was it responsible the irrational exuberance which we saw in those three years was it responsible for this or for dr subbara or his ultra loose loose monetary policy post lehman and his inability to um, you know uh, to tighten the policy and take by taking he was taking baby steps is he responsible for this or dr rang, rang or dr raguram rajan was he was he actually driving a car on first gear and then shifted to fifth gear was it too aggressive when there was no ibc in place was did he force the banks to come up clean and in the process created a problem for the banking industry because we had even higher npas in 1990s that was handled very differently so that's how the book started as you and i don't want to talk much about the book because you explained everything a very key segment of the book is poor governance take on what has gone wrong what how can it be corrected and all and then i have i have i have uh, gone to every possible detail which uh, right from the role of the rating agencies right from the non banking financial crisis many thought that many describe it as a lehman moment for india but my reading is this is a northern rock moment for india it's a plain asset liability mismatches Uh, i also delve deep into the in the into the so called corruption or misgovernance in the in banking um, how rana kapoor turned uh, yes bank uh, uh, into first my bank and then no bank for himself uh, or for that matter how chanda kochar ran uh, icici bank and the board was eating out of her hand uh, so those questions also the other side of banking which not much discussed how the bankers were hounded what do you see the so called risk aversion or 
prudence what the bankers say now uh, what is the genesis of this the fear psychosis how they have been hounded by the investigative agencies and i have given graphic description and it's it very it reads like a fiction like a bank of maharashtra uh, md he comes back to pune very late night because he had a meeting with uh, uh, then um, minister holding the finance portfolio he goes in the morning to attend his yoga classes there is no yoga exercise on that day um, it was it was a bhajana he he had to listen to a bhajana which says that be strong mentally there will be something come on that might come on your way which is not so pleasant but you have the equanimity to deal with this after that he takes his bicycle to a local sabji uh, vegetable market he picks some picks up some vegetables he comes home and lo police officers were waiting for him and he was arrested he was put in the he was kept in the police thana in the same cell where a hardcore criminal who was arrested for alleged killing killing of a builder he had to spend the night with him similarly idbi bank deputy managing director how he was picked up from his house after a thorough search and then at night he was told let's come and go to our office would you like to pick up your medicines he did not get the hint so he did not pick up his medicines <laughs> he came to the bkc office at night and he has said you were under arrest next morning he was thrown into arthur arthur road jail or uh, the case of usa anand subramaniam CEO and MD of Allahabad Bank, Netaji Shubhas Bose Road, Calcutta. Her last day in office, uh, preparation for uh, uh, her farewell is on at the boardroom. At five o'clock, the farewell will start. At four fifty-three, she gets a message from Finance Ministry DFS: "You are sacked." So she picks up her bag. Instead of going to attend her farewell, she goes home. so these are the kind of untold stories also uh, i have i have discussed and as you rightly uh, pointed out uh, professor seal the last part the sixth part is is a is a collection of 16 charts if you don't have the time to read 1 lakh close to 1 lakh 50000 words you just go through 16 charts and you get to know what's happening in this industry i'm not getting into all the details but two charts i'm just pointing out which is quite interesting uh one of them is you uh, know all of us talk about or discuss about public sector banks losing market share how much they are getting now how much their market share 70% has come down to 65% we have heard nandan nilkani talking about they will come down further or uday kotak saying that they will come down further but do we know the incremental market share of public sector banks from 2019 is less than 20% and that's not about the loan market i'm talking about even the deposit market so every 100 rupee of deposit comes to the system banking system only 20 rupees goes to public sector banks that they are proxy for government they are a quasi sovereign everybody is you know um, uh, concern about the safety of money but still 80 rupees goes to the uh, private sector so this is the state of affairs in public sector other interesting chart is the time takes for the government to identify a successor in a public sector bank for a public sector bank and get him to his office so the, i have given a chart where it shows that the time gap it it can be 100 days which is bank of baroda chairman's case bank of baroda md's case and remember bank of baroda is a case where was the first experiment of consolidation in indian banking and the uh, md goes and the next md comes after 100 days and those 100 days the bank is run by two eds which are from relatively smaller banks so are you serious about consolidation if we are serious do we allow this to happen and in some cases like in andhra bank it is nine month gap between the two so if you look all these things i wish i could have actually uh, renamed it a great indian banking comedy not a tragedy A lot of people ask me, and this is the last minute of my. <laughs> a lot of people ask me why I have called it pandemonium and tragedy, etc. Pandemonium I picked up from Milton's Hill, Milton's um, Paradise Lost, the capital of Hill. Uh, I am actually I have I am pretty illiterate about finance and banking. I am a student of English literature, so all this uh, <laughs> you will find that in the book. A lot of things, similes, and, and come from literature and other things, and also I picked up from there. Uh, typically, pandemonium we discuss about you know very shortly a roar like in in cricket state a football stadium it's happening or in Indian Parliament it's happening pandemonium. But here I have I've tried to use this to 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 focus on the chaos that's happening in the banking system for long, 
and then uh, you know it's also also refers to that you know the 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 fight between the devas and asuras what we find in in Indi- i mean indian mythology again i'm coming to mythology uh, and then you know the search of the elixir the amrita uh, which uh, there was a manthan of the sea, uh, ocean and in search of that which will make um, all of us immortal but ultimately it's it's the vish the the poison that came out and the and the shiva had to drink that um, poison to to get out of this mess so in banking system uh, after the manthan the asset quality review and the big thing the, the war against npo npa that reserve bank of india wage uh, we have got that wish or the poison of npas now who will who will play the shiva who will play the nilkantha can the bank can the public can the government continue to consume the poison in terms of pumping in capital year after year after year or do we need to approach some fund some corporate uh, sector etc etc this is an open ended question i hope uh, our budget can answer uh, some of it etc so that's 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 the that's 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 the history or that's the philosophy behind the title of the book and rest i dis- i i discuss i think i have taken more than enough 10 minutes or odd so sign over to you um happy to join the discussion after this uh thank you uh that was a great overview of the book um incidentally um I got a copy of the book and I managed to read about 3/4 of it. It is a great read and uh, uh, probably because you are a student of English literature it is so well written it, it's a, such a dry subject but it is so well written. But uh, to discuss some of these issues let's go over to the panel. Uh, we have Dr. Alok Sheep who is the RBI chair professor at ICRIA. We have uh, Mr. Anand Narayan <coughs> who is at um SPJ IMR uh we have um, uh, Mr Jaspreet Bindra who is a uh, expert on digital transformation and blockchain and of course we have Tomal Bondopadhyay the author of the book so uh the panel will be in the format that i will po- put questions to each of the panelists and uh, then they will answer the questions we'll leave some time for the Q&A at the end i can see that uh, there has been already one question put to you uh, mr bondopadhyay um, but i will come to that later uh, so let me kick off the uh, discussion with you dr sheel uh, what according to you is the main problem with the indian banking system vis-a-vis the npas and how do you think it can be resolved okay thank you sound so uh... Uh, let me begin by stating what in my opinion are uh, the three cardinal sins of indian banking uh, these emerge uh, from the book uh, one is the first is the public ownership of the banking system so uh, which leads to you know directed lending non commercial decision making and executive pressure on loans you know uh, which we are all uh, which is uh, those issues are all discussed in the book and the second uh, cardinal sin is dependence on commercial banks for project funding for capital funding normally you know commercial banks are supposed to concentrate on working capital uh, that is their core competence and uh, the related problem to that is uh, you know which again has been discussed in the book is the uh, you know the the dfis were wound up and uh, alternative source of funding in corporate bond markets which was expected to replace dfis that has not uh, taken off and uh, the third is which follows from the second is really the lack of credit appraisal skills in banks and credit appraisal skills for project finance again there's been a long discussion on uh, this uh, this book and um, uh, and of course there are other issues like inadequate uh, equity uh, you know in indian because of these lack of i think credit appraisal skills there has not been enough uh, focus on uh, you know the adequate level of equity in corporates so that the risks are not you know borne by them so now these lessons were actually clear during had emerged at the time of the first npa crisis uh, of in the, in the 90s um, following the liberalization but these were not fixed 
even though NPAs were brought down from a very high level, as uh, Tamil's book indicates that, you know, they were very high, almost 25% uh, of assets. But these issues, uh, they still linger. And uh, so uh, what is the solution? One is the immediate solution is of adequate capitalization. That is, goes what it's saying, but over the medium to long term, so that uh, whenever there is a downturn, there will always be a pressure on, uh, on the banks. For that, you need adequate capitalization. And uh, Dr. Rangarajan has discussed this issue quite well, that how in the, uh, when uh, the problem of NPAs was sought to be addressed this time around, uh, the adequacy of the capitalization was not taken into account. And you know, the, uh, the speed had to be tempered, keeping that in mind. And uh, the segregation of uh, you know, loans, which are poor judgment and fraud, and uh, implementation of the I IBC. And, uh, uh, and, and there are two, uh, two issues I would like to flag, finally. One is that uh, the current level of NPAs are not as high as in the first uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, phase of high NPAs. But that was followed by an economic boom. So capitalization took place, uh, took uh, you know, care of part of the problem. The other was of growth. But now if you look forward, you have a problem both on capitalization. And if you look forward, we'll, I think we might be discussing the state of the economy later, later and what is the prognosis. I'm quite pessimistic on the economy going forward. So which would have an adverse impact on the resolution of the uh, uh, NPAs. And finally, is you know the um, um, the experience of banking uh, 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 crises is that if they're allowed to linger, uh, it has an adverse impact on growth. It reduces growth potential, and that is what seems to have happened, among other things, in India. And as Tapan had you know drawn, I think a contrast between uh, Japan and uh, you know U uh, Japan and the and the U.S. on the one hand. Now. Even during the global financial crisis, you see uh, the US forced uh, uh, a resolution of the banking crisis early and it recovered faster than Europe where it was. For various reasons, it lingered. So I will stop there. Right. Um, so Anant, if I can come to you, uh, many attribute basically the absence of the corporate bond market to the problems the, of the NPAs in the banking sector. Uh, so how can we develop the corporate bond market in the country? Thanks, uh, Saun, and uh, thank you, Professor Shiel, for having me. And uh, Tamalda, always a pleasure to be with you on, uh, on any discussion. Um, and and uh, absolutely fascinating reading uh, your book. Um, corporate bond markets, and as the uh, panacea, I guess, for the NPA crisis, Saun, um, to start with, I don't think the corporate bond market is the uh, panacea at all. Okay, um, it is one part of and a small part of the overall solution. Um, as Professor Shield mentioned, the reality is our financial services ecosystem needs to fund our growth aspirations. We have tremendous aspirations. We have tremendous potential. At the moment, our financial services ecosystem is in no shape to finance our growth aspirations. Okay. Um, you know, this is an often mentioned statistic, total banking loans is about 104 lakh crores right now, corporate bonds is about 35 lakh crores, so let's call it 1 lakh 40, 000, uh, 140 lakh crores, uh, that's about 70% of GDP, right, and, and that's just not enough, we need a far more higher credit growth. Um, so what is required really, if you want to go to the basic question, I think one, multiple things need to happen, nobody comes out of this last 10 years looking good. Okay, neither uh, investors and, and analysts like myself, uh, nor bankers, nor auditors, nor rating agencies, nor regulators, nor government, nobody. So, you know, it's, it's a bit like what uh, Tamalda discusses in his book, you know, no one killed Jessica, which means all of us killed Jessica. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a collective murder. It's like the murder on the Orient Express, um, which, which also tells us that the way forward is, forget about the past, the way forward is there is a bunch of things which have to happen. And, you know, in the, I think it was 2016 economic survey, uh, uh, Dr. Arvind, um, you know, Subramanyam came out with this 4R framework, right, which is uh, recognize, uh, uh, recover, recapitalize, and reform. I think those four R's have to go through. Recognition, I'll just quick, quickly point to two uh, of the R's. Even today, you know, our national motto is Satyamayu Jayate, 
we have trouble recognizing the truth. We still have forbearances. We still have, you know, uh, SME mudra loan doesn't matter. Pretend it's all fine. Um, we still have NBFCs, which are far, far from the, the numbers given for NBFCs. NPAs are ridiculous. My daughter, who's a biology student, will tell you it's wrong. Okay, uh, who doesn't know the first thing about finance? So clearly, we have trouble recognizing the truth, and we never find a good time to recognize the truth. It's always no, no. Abhi, abhi mushkil hai. Now is a bad time. Let's wait for five more years, ten more years, hundred more years, and in the meantime, we are, we are, we are, you know, living in fool's paradise. So recognition is a big problem. Um, resolution IBC is good. It's a fantastic piece of legislation, but it's not geared to handling this size of NPAs. And that's a problem that we'll have to find out a, a solution to. Recapitalization can happen. I don't think capital is a problem at all. I'll quickly touch upon reforms where corporate bonds comes as well. In reforms, very quickly, you know, 60% of uh, banking, as Tamalda also said, is, is public sector banking. Uh, I don't think the problem is really government ownership. The problem is government interference. The fact that you have telephone banking had telephone banking possible in 2009, 2013. The fact that you could have mudra banking and shamiana banking now. The moment you have babus and netas getting involved in commercial banking, you're asking for trouble. By the way, so in Singapore, DBS is owned by the government, hmm. but there is an entity in between, the, you know, Temasek, which at least prevents the government from interfering in day-to-day -day operations and saying, don't borrow, don't lend, or you can't pay, you know, uh, Dinesh Khara, who's the chairman of SBI, more than 30 lakhs in a year, which is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense at all. So, you know, giving some kind of professional autonomy to public sector, even if you don't privatize, is absolutely important, which is why I think that PJNI committee recommendations are super critical for clearing that part. Mind you, this is not about governance. Governance issues are ownership neutral. Whether it is private sector banks or public sector banks or foreign banks, we are all crooks. So we need, you know, cleansing of governance, whether it is rating agencies, auditors, boards, risk management, supervision, all of that cleansing has to happen separately. Corporate bond very quickly is on, look, um, it's been growing, right? 35 trillion rupees, it's been growing. But if you, okay, and, and why is a corporate bond market good? Uh, it does a couple of things. One is uh, it helps in maturity matching, right? So if you have an insurance company and if you have a pension fund, which typically has long-term liabilities, that's best geared towards funding infrastructure and long-term investments. And a corporate bond market allows you to do that. Second thing is um, it brings in some transparency. So rather than having an opaque loan over the counter loan system, where nobody knows what the loan documentation says and you are going on the Ram, Ram Bharo say some rate mm -hmm. and some pricing for the loan, at least there is a market to determine what should be the price of a particular credit, right? And so in theory, it's great. I think the progress is being made. Um, and absolutely, I think we do need that market to progress. What can be done? Lots of things can be done. Um, to start with, we can, <laughs> We can make um, trading in corporate bonds a lot more easier. You know, um, if I, I'm supposed to be a bond markets person, but I will never buy a bond other than a tax free bond in my name directly. Moment mm -hmm. I do that, the amount of tax I pay is ridiculously high. I'd, I'd much rather buy the same bond via a mutual fund and pay much lower taxes, which makes no sense at all. So the trading culture you have in equity does not exist in bonds, even though a lot of people have views on bonds and on interest rates. Um, there are other things, including besides tax, um, including, for instance, the growth of the derivative markets, um, getting in more uh, transparent trading screens, which I think SEBI is working on. So those things will happen over a period of time. But it's not just one thing, Sawan. Uh, I think a whole bunch of things have to come together. Uh, and, and corporate bond markets, along with other reforms, is just a part of that. Sure, sure. Um so uh, flat i can turn to you um, uh, mr bondopadhyay um, would you um, throw some light on the eqr process uh, and the risk framework that rbi has well this eqr is actually the you know that's 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 uh, the instrument which reserve bank of india used um, to expose the to use a cliche soft underbelly of indian banking uh, bankers who are hiding and they are not telling the truth in the sense uh, they are not recognizing the they are held they are in a denial mode the reason being uh, multiple reasons one of the reasons could be that the main reason could be they were short of capital uh, because once you have npa you have to uh, you have to provide for it then your capital gets eroded and then forget growth even survival capital was not there because you remember this uh, 2.2 uh, trillion plus uh, recap which our former finance minister mr jetley announced it was post-AQR and all. 
so what is capital? Second, of course, again, the very structure of cap of public sector banks, because the CEOs are there, unlike Aditya Puri's 25, 26 years, they are for two years or three years. Earlier, it was even for one year. So why do you want to get into all this trouble? So let it be like, you know, keep it open, keep it closed, and then uh, leave with a high, uh, leave with a good note, pleasant note. That there are multiple issues. So first, Reserve Bank of India did what it did is something in 2014, they put this database called Cleric Data, uh, which essentially the real time information of all accounts, 50 crore plus account. And that actually set the ball rolling and that made Reserve Bank of India see that how there's a discrepancies, how one particular account is good account in one bank's book, but on one bank's book, but a bad account is another. So that was uh, there was that that exposed actually what the bankers were doing, and then uh, this uh, one of its kind uh, globally asset quality review came, um, which essentially I don't uh, I'm a regulator I don't trust your audit uh, I let let my people go and check your books and that's what happened it's a let lose its own own inspectors to each of the banks depending on the. Uh, depending on the size of the bank, the number of number of uh, inspectors and their positioning in Reserve Bank of India, that happened, and uh, that actually uh, you know exposed the entire thing what was happening. And my book, book graphically describe how it was like a you know control room twenty four by seven operated by Reserve Bank of India, away from the public glare, not in the central office but in the corporate office. And here, there's a real time uh, people are trying to, uh, people are finding out what was happening. Just to give an example, and I mentioned that, you know, uh, it, it was found that in one particular large bank, one particular account is not paid for 89 days or something like that. As you know, there's a, all the technicalities, SME 0, SME 1, SME 2. So 90 days, it becomes, uh, on 90th day, it becomes an NPA if the, if the money is not paid. So the banker was asked, the CEO was asked that what is happening? This fellow is not paying, you are not classifying. And uh, he was told that, no, no, it is it is coming. It, typically it's been paid on the last day. So we are comfortably happy that it will pay. It will come. And exactly this is what happened. On the 90th day, the money flowed in and the account was uh, saved from being uh, converted into a bad account. That's fine. But then the same inspector found that the money got into this bank uh, bank account but the very next day, the money left this bank and got into other bank account. I'm talking about it's a combination of AQR and clinic data. So, and then what was happening is this, what was 90th day for this particular bank A was 88th or 89th day for bank B, and then probably or 87th day or, nine, or bank C. So the same money was getting out and getting in and getting out and getting into other bank and all to keep the accounts or all good shape. So what happened in a consortium lending, you sanction loan, but you disbursed accordingly. So I disbursed is today, you disburse is tomorrow, Anand disbursed is day after tomorrow. So the particular account, uh, the, the borrower has the always 24 hours window to take, to give money to you and from, to money to me. And then the money leaves my bank and goes to your bank. And then the third day, it leaves your bank and goes to Anand's bank. So that was the game uh, RBI and the bankers were playing. Uh, it was, they got exposed and um, it was found that they were not doing things right. And they should be, they should, I mean, they need, they need to come, uh, come, uh, they need to show what's the problem. And there are a lot of discussion within Reserve Bank of India. There are a lot of, uh, uh, I would say there's no unanimity what should be done. But ultimately, Dr. Raghuram Rajan's uh, thing prevailed. Uh, it, they were given six quarters to come up clean. So it started uh, post AQR. AQR was done in July, August, September, around that time in 2015. And the bankers were told that you provide for uh, all the bad assets and come up clean with all your bad assets uh, in six quarters, beginning uh, December 2015 and ending March 2017. So last quarter of 2015 calendar year, four quarters of 2016 calendar year, and first quarter of 2017 calendar year, those six quarters. And if you look at the data of, of the bank's uh, NPA growth, et cetera, you will find there's a dramatic rise from December 2015. From December 2000, and there's a, another interesting part, you know, um, Reserve Bank of India have stopped giving now. I think till 2019, they were giving. There are two parallel charts where they restructure assets and NPAs. Now you'll find till 2015, 
restructured assets were pretty high npas were very low but in 2000 from 2016 onwards the npa line was catching up with the restructured assets and now it's almost the same what does that mean the banks were hiding their npas under the pile of restructured assets after aqr they have no choice but to expose themselves and npas came up so the the entire thing but unfortunately by march 2017 it did not end it got spilled over and as we speak at least three uh, uh, at least three public sector three banks in the public sectors ended up having gross npas between 1/4 and 30, 25 and 30% of their total bad assets idbi bank uco uh, in kolkata and iob in 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 chennai this all the three banks you'll find that 2019 they are around 30% 31% 28% kind of bad assets and of course rest everybody also came up so that's the story. it's a quite a sensational story it's I, rbi was working like a scotland yard um the last bit you spoke about uh, this uh, the entire uh, risk management i mean the risk appraisal i mean how rbi is inspection and all it it it, it happened uh, one of the reasons um, and that's linked to not exactly to npa but increasing number of frauds because you know what is what comes today in the uh, as identified as a fraud account but actually the fraud happened a few years back so 2019 or 2020 the sudden spot in fraud does not mean that it, it they all happened in 2019 or 20 they are all legacy frauds happened in 2014 15 16 etc cetera, etc cetera. the reasons being or the primary reason being you know around that time 2013 and all rbi shifted from camels based supervision c a m e l s where there is an acronym and each of the letter stands for certain things only s is meant something for india and uh, something else for the glo- uh, global else and all so camel stories based supervision rbi shifted around 2013 14 and the basic difference between these apart from the complexities and all uh, lack of understanding by the banks etc other part is this the focus was uh, is much less on on site supervision in the risk based supervision thing Camels was much more focused on on-site supervision. So, for instance, all the imported branches, foreign exchange branches, etc., were under the glare of on-site supervision. But in the risk-based supervision, that was not done, and which is why probably the Punjab National Bank, you will see the the foreign exchange branch, which is hundred meters away from Reserve Bank of India um, headquarters in Mumbai. on the honiman circle this punjab this punjab national bank foreign exchange branch is responsible for 2 billion plus uh, fraud lou fraud had there been on site supervision it would not have been done so uh, so camel uh, shifting from um, camel to risk based supervision there is a price to pay which rbi had done and now of course rbi in an introspection mode there is more focus on in on on site supervision and of course as uh, as we speak i think last week rbi announced the formation of a of a of a special college to look into all this inspection and supervision uh, under the under the leadership of former reserve bank of india governor uh, our deputy governor mr n s vishwanathan so rbi mm-hmm. is as addressing all the issues and plugging on the loopholes but one of the reasons uh, why you have seen increasing number of frauds etc is probably Uh, shifting from camels to risk based supervision and lessening the focus or diluting the focus on on site inspection thank you right. please great um so mr bindra if i can come to you now uh, do you think that the technology companies can become um, uh, the banking sector's biggest competitors and what role do you see for uh, digital only banks can some of these frauds etc be you know averted if we go more digital uh thank you very much uh, charan and uh, uh, thank you for having me on this uh, very distinguished panel uh tonda uh, i haven't yet read your book i'm sitting in the uk and i ordered it okay. and it's still making its way to me okay. uh, uh, right now but i did go through a very very comprehensive summary uh, and at least at least one thing i suspect i have in common with you that uh, i i also do not know anything about banking and finance uh, <laughs> it's far more about other topics uh, which includes some of the technology related topics to it while people might not believe you when you say that you certainly have to believe me when i say because i haven't written 
such um, you know extensive uh, uh, columns, articles, books on this sector that uh, that you have. Um, you know, let me start with a little story to answer your question. Uh, 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 sorry. So I came to the UK, uh, I'm in Cambridge, and I came here about four months back. Uh, and one of the first things I did was to set up a small limited company, which I did from India. It took about 12 hours to set the entire company up, a limited company where I'm a director, etc. But then, you know, a limited company is useless unless you have a bank account, a business bank account attached to it. When I came here, um, I realized that until February of next year, of this year now, I could not open a business bank account in any high street bank in the UK. Irrespective of my, of the money I bring in, irrespective of the kind of business, irrespective of the credentials or the references that I might have, I could not. And these are very big banks, Lloyds Bank, uh, HSBC, Barclays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the reason, was that they had been inundated uh, because of the newer kind of loan policies, overdraft policies, et cetera, which the government had brought in to help the financial, help the common, uh, you know, help, help customers and help trade and business, et cetera. Uh, along with the fact that uh, most of their people were working from home and they could not, they had not yet been able to set up the right processes with the right security mechanisms, et cetera. And so no one, coming into the UK could do any business for six months. They could not open a bank account. Then I learned of, uh, well, I knew of them, but then I started exploring these, what are called different things. They're sometimes called neo banks, sometimes called challenger banks, sometimes called digital banks. And the UK has been one of the countries which has opened out to these, you know, regulation, et cetera, much faster than some of the, much earlier than some of the others. Um, it took me, about 36 hours to open a business bank account in a app only bank, only an app, no branches, no ATMs, no nothing called Monzo. And by the way, it's, Monzo is not a, it's not a scam bank. It's one of, it has tens of millions of customers. It is protected by the same uh, laws, uh, which, you know, my money is protected to 85,000 pounds, et cetera, the same way that the uh, high street banks do that. I can do pretty much anything, everything that I can do out of a uh, out of a high street bank. It's much cheaper, and for the love of God, I'm not able to contact anyone at a high street bank at any point of time. Here, it, you know, through a messenger, through voice, through through the app itself, I get a representative, uh, uh, you know, quickly. And it uh, the the amount of deposits that I need to pay into the bank to open it is 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 the sum total of zero pounds. Now, how is it that in the same situation, a certain kind of banks can do business while you know, you're 80 year old, 100 year old, 300 year old, amazing legacy names, brands cannot. And the answer very frankly has to do obviously with technology. Uh, you know, one of the things that Bill Gates said, and it's a reasonably famous quote that he had uh, many years back is that we definitely need banking, but do we need banks? And so is there a way to do banking without actually a, an institution of a bank? And I think we, in many ways, we are reaching that scenario essentially because of the, of the suicide that the existing banks are committing themselves, not because of, you know, uh, uh, anything else. I mean, I, I will, I'll keep it general. I will not refer to the specifics of the Indian banking system because as I confessed right up front, I'm fairly of an ignoramus in, 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 in that specific area, et cetera. But there is things which technology can do, some of the things that uh, all of you gentlemen spoke about, which sometimes, you know, will make it difficult for the pandemonium, for the frauds, et cetera, that, uh, you know, we, we've been speaking about. Um, uh, technologies which can give transparency, technologies which can give accountability, traceability, uh, which can make the approach far more customer focused, which can in some sense replace uh, on-site supervision, you know, where you don't really need people. It could be, I mean, the whole PNB uh, 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 fracas happened in Mumbai. One of the reasons 
I, uh, I believe was that the bank was entirely not even on the core banking system. You know, the, uh, the core banking system, are, you know, certain parts of it were outside. And so, you know, the left hand never knew what the right hand uh, 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 was doing. I will speak about how digitization and digital transformation, perhaps if we have time a little later, but I'll quickly come to the, you know, can technology, so, so there's these neo banks, these challenger banks, but I think the more interesting part is, can some of these big massive technology behemoths, whether it be the Amazons of the world or the Googles of the world, uh, or even Microsofts or Facebooks of the world, can they become banks? Actually, there are actually there are many articles which say that that's what really all these technology companies want to become. Eventually, they want to become a bank. You see, they have this one thing, which all of us have, which all other companies also have, but they use that thing much, much, much better. And that thing is actually called data. These are all really data companies. They are they're not really technology companies. They are really data companies with data focused business models, and they use technology to to make money out of data. I mean, Amazon, for example, famously knows that you're pregnant before you do. Because, you know, certain bodily impulses make you search for baby stuff and it's massive machine learning or uh, algorithms crunch that data. Millions of women have been doing that earlier and it spits out first trimester, second month. Now imagine if Amazon was to get into healthcare, which it's already been trying to do. And so what is happening is that we are realizing, all of us, including them, that this era of free data is getting over. And that's a different discussion, but it is. And so the, they need to now look for other business models than just monetizing your personal data. And one of the most, most lucrative model, which is out there, is actually the banking model. And I'm saying the banking model, not banks, different things. And, and no, you see the moves, for example, Apple now is tied up with Goldman Sachs and has brought out this Apple credit card and is, uh, you know, Google with Citibank, Apple Pay, Google Pay, pretty much is replacing credit cards across the Western world and soon will in India uh, also. And so the primary interface for the customer is becoming the tech companies rather than the banks themselves. And the tech companies therefore will own the customer and the banks really become engines uh, um, at the back end. And so I think there is this, it's already happened in China with Alibaba and, you know, all these, uh, and, and, the, you know, and, and what you saw of the ant, ant financial fiasco literally was, really was this fight between, this battle between established banks and newer entrants in many ways. And we're going to see a lot of that happening. And so I think there's going to be a churn happening. We will have these new banks, which, have, which are startups, but we'll also have these big established companies coming in and technology by itself will hopefully bring in some of the transparency, accountability, traceability uh, that will prevent some of, some of the evils, if it may, that you know, Tamil and the rest spoke about. But on the other hand, it possibly might bring in a few others, which would be an interesting discussion uh, going forward. So back to you, uh, Sal. So we move from fintech to tech fins, apparently. Uh, so um, yeah, moving on to you, Anand. Um, so what about the IBC? I mean, your views on that, whether it is working well, what else needs to be done? Uh, thanks, On. Uh, so look, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the IBC is a fantastic piece of legislation, okay? and. Uh, it's been in the works for a long time. You know, it, while it came out in December 2016, it's been discussed for a long, long time. Uh, what does it do? I, I think it comes close to being a good international standard bankruptcy law, which gives a time-bound resolution um, and forces the ecosystem to, to come to a resolution. So why is it that the problem is still kind of festering and, and looking beyond just COVID? Of course, there's a standstill during COVID, but even beyond that, it's been festering for a while. Um, one is, of course, there are teething issues. No legislation can be perfect when it comes out, especially a legislation of this magnitude. And therefore, there will be a requirement for uh, teething you know, changes, etc. And second is there's been litigation. But beyond that, I think the larger issue really is the sheer size of the NPA sound. So, you know, uh, the outstanding NPAs, gross NPAs of the banks as of now is about eight and a half lakh crores, give or take. But what people 
kind of tend to overlook and and vivek call put this out very well he actually looked at what amount of um, uh, npas had been written off it's not been resolved it's just been written off right that's another 8 to 9 lakh crores 8 and a half lakh odd, odd crores so the actual outstanding npas which need to go through an ibc type of a resolution mechanism is like 17 18 lakh crores and this is pre covid can you imagine what it will look like after covid now if you have so many loans and of such magnitude there is no bankruptcy system in the world that can gear up to uh, you know this kind of scale uh, of course mr binda put very well as to how technology can help i'm sure that uh, by the way i have to confess i don't know the first thing about technology uh, you know I, i barely can plug something in and and make it work um but i'm sure there are solutions that possible there as well so which is why a one time solution for the current um, npa crisis is probably required for and uh, tamalda spoke about uh, you know the, the the poison coming out of the churn and the nilkant the requirement for nilkant you know one of the um, whispers we've been hearing about is the possibility of a bad bank being kind of uh, revived all over again in the budget um i do think it could be a good idea and i know it's a controversial point in fact people like dr rajan have absolutely um you know screamed against it and stuff like that but i do think there is a, a a good case for a bad bank and to me the case that makes sense is the parallel that was used in malaysia so after the asian crisis in the late 90s malaysia had a tremendous amount of nps you know 30 40% plus okay uh, and largely in palm oil and real estate and infrastructure etc um they came out with the bad bank which they called dana harta and it's the way it worked very quickly was the following um this was a bad bank created um by the government it is owned by the government it it was manned by professionals including by foreign professionals which is very interesting you know mahathir mohammed if you remember was the guy who was railing against foreigners for you know playing around in in malaysia and he brought in foreigners to run this bank okay and what did he do he got these experts to give a price for every single large bad loan so if your loan is worth 100 crores and the recovery experts think it's worth only 40 crores so you say i can take it off from you at 40 crores to all the large banks okay now the problem is the banks have not provision up to down to 40 right mm -hmm. people have provision maybe up to uh, up to 70 or 80 so what do you do so you have two choices as a bank either you sell at 40 to this bad bank or if you say no 40 is too low that's fine you keep it on your books but you mark it down to 40 okay. which means at least you take the pnl hit and you 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 reserve for it now the, the problem with that is what stops the bad bank from quoting extremely low for everything you know and forcing you therefore to to take a markdown at a very low number so the the way it worked was the bad bank if the actual recovery let's say was 70 mm -hmm. over a period of 3 years which means you recovered 30 more than where you purchased it 80% of the profit you give back to the original bank so out of the 30 24 goes back to the original bank so there was a nice you know quid pro quo mm -hmm. which kind of enticed the banks to get rid of the npas and give it to the bad bank how did that help by and by the way that uh, that collation happened okay how did that help a lot of the npas as in the case of india was because of government policy you know coal mines being banned in our case or 2g licenses cancelled or or you know uh, other things happening right um when you consolidate the bad, bad, the, the bad loans into one owner rather than having 16 lenders trying to figure out how to coordinate the the way to resolve them becomes easier you can change regulations you can you have one person taking the call and you're doing it in a time bound fashion by the way danaharta close shop in 5 years it doesn't exist now so it was given a time bound regime that you know you have to close on this time and of course they also did a lot of extraneous thing including changing regulations etc post facto etc but nevertheless it worked out pretty well and they achieved a recovery of close to 60% which was the all time record for the asian crisis okay worked out extremely well now the problem with the bad bank though and the the valid criticism which comes out someone is that this is good money after bad right you're throwing good money you're giving the capital you're doing the recovery you're doing the, all the hard work and then the bankers go back to doing the old business of again creating bad loans right which is why a bad bank by itself is not enough you have to I'll go alongside with that with reforms and what right. we discussed earlier which is you know whether it is public sector reform of pjni committee or getting some distance between delhi and the bankers um giving a you know level playing field make the public sector bankers also under companies act rather than under bank nationalized act, uh, act get them out of the clutches of cbc cbi cag etc uh, allow them to hire and fire allow them to pay market prices to their own people right and and hold them accountable in the board fashion and of course all the governance reform so 
it has to go alongside so here is my i am an amchai professor i can give this gyan and move on so my as an amchai professor my gyan is um ibc is good it is good for a flow business so which means mm-hmm. once you've sorted out the business on an ongoing right. business ibc can mm-hmm. take care of the npas as they arise it cannot handle the stock the stock mm-hmm. is vast and it you know right. even the even the chapter 11 the us would struggle with this kind of sizes coming through at the same time there's simply not enough in the pipe to mm-hmm. to manage this mm-hmm. so you do need a one off solution mm-hmm. but that could descend into being good money after bad and therefore you have to ensure that reforms and accountability goes along with these uh, with a bad bank solution but i think it is inevitable eventually if you want the banking system to finance growth in this country you have to do this cleansing that that nilkant that uh, tamalda spoke about has to happen right great so um coming to you dr shiel um so if, uh, post the global financial crisis should we have financed industry in a different way than we have done or um i mean what what do you what is your take on that okay the battle of ifs is never lost uh <laughs> so uh, uh let me start by saying that you know on the eve of the global financial crisis the huge stock of npas had been brought down to a level where you could say that the banks were adequately capitalized now uh what does adequate capitalization means uh, and what is capitalization for actually it is that it is well known that you will have you know the, you have the business cycle and once you have a downturn in a business cycle which is you know which will happen from time to time npas will rise and uh, these npas will be resolved in two uh, in two ways one when growth returns it will fall down and then the ones where you know the businesses fail on account during the downturn you have the capital provisioning to as a cushion so uh but the indian bank so uh, when we come to the boom of the first decade it was actually an economic boom it was not a financial bubble so you know the credit growth there was a demand uh, for credit the, uh, the the problem was that uh, the uh, uh credit what you call uh, uh, assessment the did not take into account maybe because you know the banks uh, do, do not have these skills in project financing they should have factored in the fact that growth is above potential they assume that growth is you know we are going to continue to grow at 9% so when growth uh, declined um uh, um the uh, the cardinal sins ensured that these would translate into uh, high npas um, more than what what would have been expected in the absence of these cardinal sins mm. so i would say that to some extent you know uh, you had these flaws in the system so how would the, you know bankers have should that have how would that have influenced their uh, uh, decision making should they, should they have been far more uh, uh, conservative conservative one in uh, taking into account that this is growth is above uh, you know uh, uh, above potential but secondly if the bankers had known okay we have these uh, problems in the banking system and uh, uh, even if we sort of uh, are, don't um, lend as aggressively then um, uh, what do you call uh, uh our loans would not turn sour uh so that's a difficult uh, thing to you know answer as i said it, it, it's a it's a battle of ifs the growth was real so there was a demand for mm. uh, demand for credit in hindsight it is easy to say that you know they should not have lent but then you would not have had that level of growth yeah. and and this was not a growth it was not a as if it's an india specific growth this was a growth across emerging markets right but it is because of these uh, weaknesses in the banking system that you know it translated into uh, uh, npas um uh, so if i can turn to you tomalda and can, uh, focus on the nbfc segment because some of the problem actually then started in the nbfcs and we've seen all of these you know the um 
in infrastructure related nbfc is giving us a lot of headache mm. uh well i think you are hinting at without naming ilfs uh, that's a separate story altogether because in india i think we experimented with two uh, infrastructure financing companies one is ilfs and one is idfc both of them have failed mm. idfc had to be converted into a bank uh, which is why it got the license i mean otherwise there's no reason if you remember 2011 uh, budget when pranam mukherjee spoke about uh, giving banking licenses it was meant for financial inclusion now idfc got the license not for financial inclusion because so for him it was a not a uh, not a not a not an application for license i think it was a mercy petition otherwise I, idfc would have uh, would have gone down under of course it's a very different story than ilfs ilfs is a story of fraud misgovernance uh so wherever we have tried this um, infrastructure financing company there was no responsibility there was no accountability it was allowed to do the way it was and uh, and the previous md and ceo of ilfs ran like a promoter but left like a uh, like a professional we allowed him to leave so that's a separate story we did not well, let's not discuss that it's a very unique case uh but overall nbfc problem which we saw in 2018 i think it was a banking problems spilled over to the nbfc tarp why i am saying this you remember post aqr and post the um, the what we got the what was the real health of the banking system 11 banks were under pca so they mm-hmm. were not allowed to give fresh loans so it was a sort of in football what are you calling walk over the mm-hmm. the opponent team did not even there was no op- uh, opponent team so the nbfc had their entire ground for themselves and they grew like anything and they took advantage of the cheap money at that point of time and 2018 was the time where uh, then rbi governor started uh, closing the tap and hiking the rates and the short term rates rose around i think 150 170 basis point and that created the problem the alarm bell rang because all these nbfcs were 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 uh, were had massive asset liability mismatches they were borrowing short and lending long uh, they are just getting 90 day cps and rolling it over i think one of the um, uh, foreign brokerages or or research houses um, uh, came out with a report sometime in late 2018 post that uh, nbfc crisis and dissected what was the exposure of short term cps on their liability side it was for some of them it was as much as 40% or so so it was as i said it was a it was a sort of apart from other issues of governance issues etc it was primarily an asset liability mismatch uh, which is why i call it a northern rock moment and they had to fall and um, there was my understanding is this at least for one particular entity i would not name uh, there was a there was an asset quality review uh, aqr was there Uh, of course it was not it was not it is not officially said but they did find out something and uh, they did find out um, all those wrong doings were happening what i heard professor uh, anand narayan talking about the nbfcs in pas are pretty high and they are and they are hiding it yes of course uh, of course um, it's it's not the correct picture um, they there are a lot of uh, they are not uh, they are not telling the truth not all of them at least and the other dimension is of course uh, the problem with the hfcs on the one hand there is a very soft touch regulations there is a gray area um, nhb was a regulator which is a completely failed regulator now it has come to reserve bank of india and on the other hand uh, the uh, people running hfcs were not uh, you know you, you will see that they are called hfcs but the kind of exposure they have to the corporate sector i mean the wholesale wholesale uh, segment not the retail segment so that's of course uh, that's i mean that that created all sorts of problem and nhb uh, nhb was a sort of very ineffective regulator uh, under the nhb act i think it could not uh, could not uh, impose a penalty beyond a few lakhs or so which is why you will find that how the on housing was found doing things which is not exactly correct in the sense uh, they were restructuring bad loans without the approval of the board and for the, they were found um, it was found and they are penalized some piddly amounts because the under the nhb act uh, regulator could not punish them enough hmm. uh, so it was a combination of 
banking sector crisis spilling over to NBFC, NBFCs because uh, the banks were major majority and then a lot of banks were not, as I said, 11 banks were not allowed to lend. So NBFCs were grabbing the market with both hands. It was a, a liquidity sugar rush post demonetization mm -hmm. and uh, they were getting short, uh, they were getting cheap money and rolling over the short term liabilities to create long term assets. It was a problem of, uh, it was a problem of the, with the HFCs, uh, they are floating all sorts of rules, but a very ineffective regulator um, either could not detect it or even if you detected it, it, its capability to punish them was extremely limited. So there are, there are at least three dimensions. And uh, that's what we had. And ILFS, of course, is a separate story, as I explained to you. Now, of course, the HFCs are being governed by Reserve Bank of India and RBI had a discussion paper and now they have come out, they were given a glide path. What can they do? What they cannot do? They need to bring down their exposure to corporate law, corporate lending and wholesale lending within a certain time frame, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I think things will get better. Uh, but yes, that was the situation. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Bindra, if I can um, come to you about, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, demonetization has been mentioned and many things happened post demonetization. But um, um, again, uh, due to the pandemic, we are seeing an increase in digital uh, payments increase. Uh, I mean, it has gone up significantly. Uh, what scope do you see for the digital transformation in India uh, becoming a more permanent kind of uh, move that we, you know, I mean, after demonetization, three quarters after that, we went back to cash again. Uh, uh, so um, what do you see post the pandemic this next year, this year, next year? How do you see that? Okay. Uh, so, you know, um... COVID has been obviously the defining, defining uh, intervention of this decade or probably certainly more than that. And, you know, a lot of people are calling COVID this black swan, you know, something which is unpredictable as well as disruptive. Uh, I don't think COVID frankly was a black swan because it was entirely predicted that, uh, that a pandemic like this is going to happen. What was the black swan, however, were the lockdowns which accompanied it. No one predicted those. And the lockdowns are the one which kind of, you know, uh, 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 which disrupted everything and which kind of caused all the issues that we uh, see right now. The very interesting thing about COVID is this paradox, which in one of my books I call the COVID paradox, okay, which is that COVID actually slowed down the world, but it accelerated change. And it's very interesting. It did slow down the world. You know, all of us had to stick to where we were, travel stopped, airlines stopped, et cetera, et cetera. But things which were slowly happening, many things, suddenly started happening much faster in an accelerated manner. Obviously, the most common uh, example of this is working, you know, and working from home, working from anywhere. Uh, the future of work was supposed to happen over the next 10 years, 20 years, which would have all these things. Uh, but it kind of just happened like in a like in couple of weeks. Now, the same thing can possibly be talked about, uh, you know, payments and then the whole digital landscape, et cetera. Uh, usually, they say that it takes about 20, 21, 22 days to build a new habit and about 66 days, according to all kinds of research, for this habit to become a behavior. Now, many of our lockdowns have actually been more than these 60 days, 65 days, 70 days. And many things that we had to do because of the lockdown will going forward, uh, some, some of these will become habits, some of these will become behaviors. The other very critical, very important thing that happened was that people who had been paying lip service to digital and to technology very rapidly and in an accelerated fashion became believers. So, uh, if you think about the last seven, eight, nine months, the companies which were 100% digital were, the, which were actually anti-fragile. They actually boomed in the crisis. Companies mm -hmm. which were 0% digital stopped. And the companies which were somewhere in the middle, parts of, the, parts of it worked, parts of it didn't. 
And so this whole digital, this whole clamor for digital transformation now, that how can I become, uh, as, I cannot, not every industry can become 100% digital, but how can we become as digital as possible? And mm -hmm. I, I think that, and how can our business models become as digital as possible? So, you know, for a, uh, a retail outlet, it would mean omnichannel retail plus uh, plus uh, uh, e-commerce, healthcare, semi-digital, semi-physical, uh, education, semi-digital, semi-physical. And I do think that the same would therefore move to uh, the same feeling or the same need uh, as kind of will, is moving to all sectors, including the banking sector. Uh, now, actually, if you look at it very dispassionately, the banking sector has actually been, from a consumer or a customer point of view, been more digital than many others, you know, even in India. You know, mm -hmm. there is the same old thing of the last time that you went to a bank or the amount of times that you go to an ATM, et cetera, et cetera. But all of this is actually in the top 5%, 7% of the population. The challenge is that how this could become more digital, you know, uh, uh, going below uh, below that. Uh, if in some sense the demonetization was a stick to become digital, which didn't work, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, perhaps these disruptive events will be the carrots, you know, which would mm -hmm. make that the, this is the only thing that you do. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, your business uh, pretty much stops. Uh, across the world, uh, uh, this has forced all businesses, including banks, uh, COVID especially, to become more and more digital. And I think the same thing is going to happen uh, uh, in in uh, in India. Uh, I mean, if I again go back to come uh, to close on the example for my my own personal story or my own example for the Neo Bank, the reason that they could open my account while the others could not, was because most of their processes are digitized, because technology has replaced human intervention. Uh, the, the 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 high street banks did not have the people available to you know look at my credit rating to kind of you know figure out whether I was a good credit risk etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, AI and and multiple other technologies did that for uh, for the neo banks they went up and crawled my uh, credit scores and got that out it went to my social networks and figured out what kind of person I am LinkedIn to find out what my professions etc uh, et cetera, are, and therefore this whole automation, uh, uh, you know, which is intrinsic to the business model, uh, help them uh, make so. You know, there was a very interesting uh, comment which uh, was made by Harish Chawla, uh, one of the venture capitalists and a great commentator on digital things in India, who said that because of COVID, now there are going to be two types of companies or two types of banks, if we were to talk about banks in specific, the digital and the dying. And I think we've talked a lot about the dying mm -hmm. okay, during this uh, <laughs> conversation. And possibly one way to go out of that is, is to become digital because the companies which will be the leaders in any sector, including banks going forward, will need to be tech at core. They'll need to be technology companies, not necessarily banking companies. The greatest retailer is a technology company doing retail, not a retail company doing technology. Which is Amazon. Airbnb is not is a tech company doing hospitality. Uber is a tech company doing transportation. Swiggy is a tech company doing deliveries. Now, how do banks become tech companies doing banking rather than banking companies doing technology? Which is what the latter is what is trying to happen. And so I think this particular crisis will accelerate that process, hopefully, also in India. Back to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sheel, uh, if I can come to the recovery, um, you know, you have talked about the swoosh in one of your articles. Uh, do you still see a V-shaped recovery for the country or are we looking, I mean, has vac the vaccine changed anything as far as the recovery is concerned? Okay, so the, when we talk of the recovery, I think we need to make a distinction between a rebound and a recovery. Now, we had a very sharp decline in growth. One of the 
fastest in uh, of the one of the steepest in uh, emerging markets and the current estimate is that in 2021 there'll be a decline of minus about seven and a half percent uh, uh annually uh quarter i mean if you the first quarter 20 about 25 percent but you know overall about 7.5 percent now to that so if you want to return to the baseline if you just do the uh, math uh, which is what a v-shaped recovery would entail to this minus 7.5 percent you add a further 5.5 percent which is what the economy would have grown uh, normally and 5.5 is a fairly conservative uh, you know figure for for growth uh, which means that you have lost about 13 percent of gdp of uh, of output mm. and now we go on to uh, the next financial year 21 uh, 21 22 so if you want a v-shaped recovery you'll have to grow at around 18 percent mm. first you recover this 13 percent plus 5.5 percent growth for next year so that is what a v-tail recovery would entail mm -hmm. the uh, other uh, scenario is that you at least in end of 21 22 you at least get back to where you were in uh, nine before uh, before the crisis and uh, for that still also you'll need about uh, uh, seven point five percent growth in the next year then you are back to where you were uh, so for two years you have not grown but you are, you are back to anything below that you would actually be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, would still be lower than what you were in 1920 so now which of these scenarios is more likely or towards uh, which is closer to this i would say it is the latter scenario mm -hmm. and the reason is that we have uh, you know we have some advanced estimate we have some estimates which have come in and these estimates typically uh, are derived from pr projections from the formal sector for which data is readily available and we know that it is the informal sector small businesses and job destruction is actually not reflected in this so this might be overstating growth mm -hmm. and then unlike uh, you know uh, the western countries where you had a fiscal a large fiscal stimulus mm -hmm. so which could keep you know small businesses uh, and uh, people without income going without uh, uh, actually going into their drawing down their savings uh, that has not taken place there has been and much of this actually is currently masked by the regulatory forbearance you had the moratorium and then you had uh, uh, you know uh, measures taken after that so uh, you know the actual uh, what you call business destruction might actually there'll be more down the line and if you see rbi's uh, 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 financial stability report it talks of you know a sharp increase even in the baseline in, um, in 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 NPAs. So, and then once we go on to what was the economy before COVID? Now, before COVID, you had several quarters of declining growth. I mean, each successive, and the last was less than four percent. Right. And uh, that is the scenario without uh, COVID. So, how do you? And the reason behind this was that if you uh, consider growth as con consisting of three engines of growth exports investment and consumption serially one by one you know started uh, you know shutting down and uh, uh, how do you expect uh, this thing to change and even if growth were to uh, you know revive you have your banking crisis there the twin balance sheet problem remains the banks are hesitant to lend and uh, you have uh, corporate balance sheets uh, that are impaired. So, uh, as uh, you know, pointed out by Jaspreet, uh, is that you would you would still have some businesses which will do very well, which mm -hmm. will recover well, and some you know which are going to you know really struggle. So the next shape is the K-shaped recovery that you know which people are talking about that some will do well, mm -hmm. especially sure. the technology companies and 
somewhere because restructuring is taking place and uh, businesses have collapsed you know they will not come up so but if you sort of uh, uh, average it out you will have this i would what i call the sush recovery it's a very you know like a shape like the nike logo that it is going to be a very gradual recovery so i would say there would be a rebound because the fall has been uh, very very sharp and uh, you know when they they say a, a dead cat bounces that the higher it falls you know mm-hmm. from a greater height the more it seems to rise but then it will uh, it will go down and uh, so um, uh, uh, so and then what is the role of the rbi so one thing we have not discussed is uh, is monetary policy right and uh, monetary policy if you have a banking crisis you know uh, it's like pushing on a string you may lower rates but if banks are hesitant to lend and businesses are you know the balance sheets are impaired how do you get the credit going and this is what has happened you had a uh, fairly easy monetary policy but you know where has been the credit growth and mm-hmm. that thing is going to persist even post uh, covid so um, as i say i am not very uh, optimistic on the economy going uh, forward and i see uh, as it said a sush a nike mm-hmm. sush recovery i'll stop there anant if i can uh, turn to you um, so given this scenario what is your ask from the budget for the banking sector <laughs> right look um uh i guess the ultimate thing for india um, really is about jobs and output um if we can get output and jobs every single macroeconomic variable that we are concerned about whether it is growth inflation export everything will come through right consumption and and uh, professor shield mentioned you know consumption exports investments you know everything will go into into a into a nice virtuous cycle um so you know we t- we have we talked about the financial sector we talked about digitization we didn't talk about the real sector a lot of the problems that we saw in the in the in the financial npas etc was because the real economy was not performing you give infrastructure loans and then you have a whole set of real sector issues which come in the way of implementation execution what do you expect to happen on the financial sector anyway but coming back to your broader question what do you what do you what would you like from the finance minister for particularly for the financial sector um look um, the the uh, fiscal deficit is looking terrible okay uh, we we were Uh, my own expectation is that for this fiscal year fy21 this combined center plus state true fiscal deficit because again that satyameja dete works in the fiscal numbers as well it's all a complete balder dash the actual number is probably 15% of gdp okay so it's a it's a gigantic number next year things will improve because our economy will recover you know tax income will go up but even so uh, your your central fiscal deficit could be somewhere around 6% of gdp okay but here is the deal son so i wouldn't mind the government spending more money okay i'm supposed to be a fiscal hawk by the way but i wouldn't mind the government spending more money as long as they do a few things one is improve transparency don't give us this gyan about you know off balance sheet on balance sheet um, you know flowery re- re- revised estimates and all that stuff give us the truth okay first part second part reduce your revenue expenditure push money into capital expenditure and this includes not just into infrastructure which is obviously required but also into things like education into uh, nutrition into healthcare into public services including sanitation etc these are all close to our heart anyway push money there i'm all for it because i think it will go do a go a long way into this whole point about creating jobs and output in the country then comes this look a lot of good things are happening to be fair to the government i keep criticizing the government but there is labor reforms there is um, you know taxes have been brought down the corporate taxes have been brought down they are doing pli the production link incentive to try and bring in supply chains into india so they are trying what they can try but effectively for for actual jobs and output to come about you finally need the financial services ecosystem to be able to fund our growth as well right our entire credit to gdp the discussion that we had earlier so what we discussed earlier one is please go about doing this entire 4 r structure which is you know recognize um, uh, you know uh, recover uh, recapitalize as well as reform and in reform is extremely important look at pjni committee look at maybe the possibility of a bad bank or some solution for the npas that you have currently and put in place 
essentially today bankers on are simply not able or willing to lend now we talk about the ability and willingness of borrowers to pay back here you have the lender itself not able or willing to lend right and you want that ecosystem to be thinking about lending again for that to happen um you you do need these four hours to go through and i'm i'm hoping that happens um and a company that with a uh, fiscal spend a company that with reforms to try and make it easier to create jobs in this country if people like uh, mr bindra want to create jobs in this country they shouldn't have to run from pillar to post they should be welcomed with open arms as they were in in china 20 years ago right put out a red carpet and bring them in so i'm hoping that happens it's a tough order but uh, sound it's not going to be easy as i said it's easy for a professor sitting on the chair out here to say uh, you know do all of this it's much more difficult to implement this you're already seeing the protests against the agricultural reforms for instance so imagine if they say we will do banking reform which sounds like privatization imagine and plus they've already done labor reforms imagine the kind of protests which can come so it's going to be a tough ask but i think it's uh, it's an opportunity the bottom line good news though sound is there is no problem in this country which cannot be solved i think i think every every problem can be solved uh, hopefully we solve the problems because of the government rather than despite the government uh, and the budget can be a good starting point to that wonderful i think we are into the last few minutes of our discussion and there is a, a question that i see on the chat uh, this is i guess uh, any of you can take it what will be the share of digital banking in, in india in 2025 um any guesses or if you have any numbers <laughs> that you can project you know i i sorry sorry i jumped in because i saw the word no no digital. please please i'll speak on the digital part the bank part someone else can take it <laughs> but but my i would rephrase the question as to whether there will be a digital bank till 2025 okay a purely digital bank the way digital okay. banks are supposed to be look there have been uh, uh, there have been uh, in india we talk about india obviously there have been attempts you know uh, dbs which was spoken about actually uh, has uh, has actually forayed into they did a whole internal experiment within dbs globally and chose india as a place to said that they would do a uh, an end to end digital bank and they tried but i don't think uh, without knowing too much of the subject i don't think our regulation allows that entirely uh the other one which is more famous probably is 811 by uh, uh kotak and uh, just as a side interest 811 the name came out from actually the date of demonetization uh, which was 11th uh uh 8 11 8 actually uh and so uh, or 811 811 and so uh the 811 that's right and so so did kotak and it's not it's not really taken off okay again because of i think more systemic intrinsic issues and very frankly i think an existing institutional trying to start a totally digital uh, 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 inst- institution within itself uh, usually does not work as well as you know a, a technology company or a pure startup doing that there are conversations there are startups which are trying to do neo banks uh, there are blockchain based solutions which are kind of being talked about out there but i would be very happy if we have a purely digital bank if there's an enabling regulation infrastructure to have a purely digital neo bank in india by 2025 rather than even share of that so that's that's my opinion i think that answers it um can i just so add think, uh, sound if you don't mind uh, yes yes please please go ahead with the caveat i mentioned earlier that i have zero knowledge about technology but very quickly i think look um, what mr bindra said which actually struck struck a chord with me um i'm okay disclosure i'm on the board of a bank uh, but i can tell you that every bank um thinks of itself as a tech company now pretty much you know you you hear this buzzword of digital in every bank now and every bank which wants to make a difference uh, second thing i want to add is um, you know the power of digitization is not just for uh, ease of access and um, financial inclusion and stuff like that uh, what we discussed about in terms of npas a very quick story is on um in 2018 beginning i think it was no 2019 beginning uh, there was a report which came out from redd red a company in singapore a very small company research company in singapore which talked about um, a particularly large hfc um, which has since gone bust but anyway so that particular company where it did a forensic about how this company was siphoning out money allegedly mm-hmm. and it gave a lot of details about redd you can google it up it gave a lot of details about something called box structures on how this money was being siphoned out and and taken out of the country okay 
uh, taken out of the uh, out of the ecosystem. Um, I happened to call the analyst who wrote this because it had a incredible amount of detail about which company name, how is this box structure being created, who are the people involved, and so on and so forth. So I called this analyst. This was a 35 year old analyst sitting in Singapore, uh, and he claimed to be completely underpaid. So I asked him, "Who's your source? I mean, who's given you all this information?" He mm -hmm. said, "My information is Google, and I just know what questions to ask." to mr google okay mm -hmm. and this was this completely blew my mind so he he was actually right so you know in mm -hmm. the mca website there's a tremendous amount of data there's a lot of chatter on social media uh, he was actually mining all of that and and you know thinking through all of or listening to all of that and coming up with this analysis and he put the pieces together and then he had a counter question to me he said i am one underpaid kid sitting in singapore and having zero access to whatever is happening in this country and i can tell you there is this problem with this mm -hmm. particular entity which by the way went bust eventually you got an army of bankers credit officers uh, research analysts rating agencies auditors sitting in the country what are you guys doing and why is it taking you so long to figure these things out so I, look um, one of the problems we have in this country uh, average deposit rates as per rbi report has come down to about 5.6% you know one year cd rate is about close to 4% right now right i can right. tell you bankers who tell you that Uh, i can still lend to good credit at 14 15% now either they are smoking something or we are so underbanked that you know you can get get away with with murder but the difference between the lending cost and the borrowing cost is still extremely high and one reason for that is lack of trust if you don't trust your borrower um, you're going to charge the moon right uh, information can actually make that life of the credit decision a lot easier and this is again an area where digitization can really help giving you know the whole process of disintermediation giving hmm. me comfort that the borrower is is of good standing we have gst data now we have civil scores of course we have a plethora of data available on on cash flow everything is getting digitized anyway so if you can get access to that you can get a lot more comfort around credit and therefore bring down this gap that you have between between cost of funds and the uh, for for borrower and for lender so i i think the future is bright um, digitization is inevitable for banking even though i don't understand the first thing of it so i become redundant but um, it is definitely the future is bright and i think we will go down that path and in a way we are good because we we will skip a whole part of the banking that the us etc went through and we will go directly into digitization of of banking which is probably good for us Uh, Dr. Sheel, uh, you wanted to make it. Yes, uh, not a comment, but I have a question for our fintech uh, expert. Uh, just a query: Is uh, you know uh, uh, digital digital banking or digi uh, you know greater use of technology in uh, in banking? And you referred to that you see technology companies going into banking rather than you know banking companies uh, becoming more technological. Uh, the uh, when you talk of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, what about things like uh, developmental finance because you know tamil had uh, you know referred to the whole question of on site uh, what do you call um, and off site and in developmental finance you know a question of uh, judgment and uh, um, on site uh, scrutiny and monitoring are very important so to what extent can you know technology take care of and and india needs a lot of developmental finance and much of the npas uh, relate to you know the infrastructure finance and that problem and if you're going to get infrastructure finance going uh, again this problem will remain and historically you know i think there was a world bank study in the in the 90s or something where they said that much of the investment in infrastructure in developing countries was directly or indirectly funded through the fisc either through you know tax uh, you know uh, tax exempt bonds or directly from the fisc and in india we have relied a lot on the market and the capacity of the market to be able to absorb risk in infrastructure is fairly limited so this problem remains to with us and how will the digital uh, technologies help so first of all let me disabuse you of the uh... of the impression that i am a fintech expert okay i uh, yes i do work in technology but fintech um, there are vastly better people much people who have really worked in that far far more than i have uh, so let me just take this in a slightly more general way uh uh kushil if uh, if i may so first of all i am one of those you know there are these two schools of thought uh in terms of technology and human beings 
and once there are two extremes one extreme is that there are certain things which human beings can only do which technology will never replace and the other extreme is ai especially or what is more more precisely referred to as agi or artificial general intelligence will eventually replace everything that a human being does actually for the second school there have been a bunch of things especially this year and to some extent last year which have lent a lot of credence to this ai replacing human beings there have been advances which have which were just un, unheard of uh, something called gpt3 which could which can actually write novels create text answer questions much better than many human beings can in a very you know instinctive manner uh, a human manner uh, uh, games being played rembrandt artists kind of artists uh, art being created by ai which you never thought uh, so there are a lot lot of lot of things that where you know we 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 believe that we are heading towards that route now what i believe and what many most of the technologists have come to believe is that neither of the two is actually going to be happening in a lot of ways it's somewhere in the middle where ai or technology will help a human being do his or her job better okay and so there are there are certain areas which you know it's going to become extremely difficult for technology to do a human being's role most of the time you know sometimes people refer to the real ai as not artificial intelligence but augmented intelligence okay where there is a human being augmented with technology or a technology augmented with human beings which could help solve or you know uh, do some of the things which were difficult to do i mean the google example is a primitive form of that where you know you didn't need an army of people there was a human being who still had to put this thing together he got all the information etc but he still had to connect the dots make the story create this whole picture together and technology will be able only be able to do that in a limited uh, limited uh, fashion not the uh, not the whole thing and so if, you know i i will not be in a position to answer your specific question regarding developmental but you know some of the uh, some of the uh, decisions which were being taken in a purely human non transparent purely subjective manner could perhaps become more transparent more objective and happen faster than what they were the you have also mentioned governments in fact the last thing that i would say that one of the things which is actually going to happen more and more is that the role of governments in technology is going to become bigger rather than smaller you know there was this whole thing that technology and government should be separate government stays away from technology but now the way the technology has become so powerful you've seen what is happening in the us or uh microsoft opening a un representative body etc cetera, etc cetera, that technology is becoming super powerful and now actually government is going to have to come in and regulate vast portions of that and so they will actually start working together in multiple ways including in some of the ways that you mentioned so as i said i'm not a fintech expert i would not be able to answer your specific developmental uh uh banking question but on a more general basis i believe that technology could come in and help supplement what human beings are doing to make it better faster more transparent with more information more objective rather than subject thank you so uh, in fact dr shil uh, i hear that there is a talk about reviving the dfis but we'll have to see about that so um thank you all i think we are completely out of time and uh, we have to bring unfortunately bring to close this discussion uh vasundra if you would actually just give the vote of thanks um good evening everyone uh, i would like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists of the session dr alok shil mr tamil bandyopadhyay mr jaspreet bindra and mr anand narayan for taking the time to share the valuable insights with us today regret from dr rajit kathuria who could not join the session i would like to thank dr shaunre for moderating today's session i would also like to thank the team at ikrea for their support in organizing this webinar finally i would like to thank all the attendees for joining us today thank you thank you thank so you so we close with that uh, it has been a wonderful discussion thank you all Thank you very much. Thank Shandra. you. Bye bye. Thank you, anchor and uh, moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you.
See you, everybody. See you. Bye. See you, Tamal Das. See you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Yeah.